Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, bonamuli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so delighted and so, so, so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids' teachers, their librarians, their principal. And please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Audible, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, Ghana, Himalaya, wherever you find your podcasts. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Becoming Strong by Ananda Moy Baker. Becoming Strong is an illustrated children's chapter book about an adorable little bee named Jazienza who has a bent antenna and must wear glasses. She gets bullied at times, and through the sage advice of Mama Queensy Bee, the Queen Bee, she learns to become strong, confident, and kind. The book not only helps children learn breathing techniques to deal with anxiety, but also enables them to connect on a deeper level with nature. In addition, a clear message in the book is that we are all important and valuable, and our lives have meaning no matter our size. Becoming Strong is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read and would be a fantastic addition to any family library. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by The Adventures of Toby Baxter, Book 2, River Home for the Holidays. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read written by Tim Wright. River Home for the Holidays delivers a captivating blend of humor, danger, and inspiration. For lovers of fantasy with mythical creatures, this book is a must-read, promising, a thrilling, and heartwarming adventure. Dive into the enchanting world of River Home alongside Toby Baxter, and you won't be disappointed. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read, great middle grade novel. You want to add this to your family library. The Adventures of Toby Baxter, book two, River Home for the Holidays, written by Tim Rice. Join us right now from the beautiful state of California. Our guest is here today to celebrate lots of her books. We're going to start by talking about her latest book. It's called Nancy Best Had a Dress. Please welcome to the show. Claire Nolan. Hey, Claire, how are you? Hi, I am thrilled to be here. I just want to say I love your podcast. I've learned so much about so many different authors and been introduced to so many awesome books. So I can't believe it. I get to be here and talk about mine. So thank you for the invitation. Well, you know, all those nice things you said about me, the podcast can't get any better. Thanks a lot for being here. We'll, no, no, we'll get <laughs> So you were telling me uh, a little bit about Nancy Best Had a Dress. What a delightful story. Please tell the audience um, about the book. I will. It is uh, launching on March 19th of 2024 with Gnome Road Press. Amazing, absolutely stunning illustrations by Angela Hawkins, who lives in Colorado. It tells a story of a young girl during the latter years of the Depression in the 30s. And she gets to go with her family into town to the general store and choose a flower sack that when they finished using the flower will be made into her dress. So this is during a time where people used everything that they had and wasted nothing. So they finally get to make her dress. But Nancy best grew as little girls do and she outgrew her dress So she made it into an apron and fed the chickens and then the dress rips. So she makes it into a satchel and she uses it to pick the oranges, but then the strap breaks and it gets smaller and smaller as she um, makes it into new things. And finally, at the end, she really has nothing, but she looks into the uh, basket, her scrap basket and sees all the pieces and she's not going to waste them. But meanwhile, in a wordless form, you can see that her mother is um, 
having a new child. So the very last page is a surprise and just a beautiful ending. And I hope you all read it. I request it from your library because I think you'll really enjoy this book. You know, this sounds uh, like uh, just a dear, dear, wonderful story. And uh, we like to talk about the conversations that families can have. And, of course, talking about what our grandparents, great-grandparents went through during the Depression and how, you know, we didn't always live in this time of fast fashion and wastefulness and, you know, how, how things have have so changed so much here in the United States and other Western countries. But I think it's also a way to talk to kids about the fact that there are people who are still living like this. Yes. And, you know, and opening up their eyes to the fact that we're really blessed in this way. And, um, uh, and, and what are we going to do with these blessings? Right. That's a, that is a very, very good point. And I think, well, you just look at all the waste that is going on. And um, I, I think that that is such a good point. And I hope that children come out with that and talking to parents and also so that they can look at what they have and how maybe they can reuse what they have or they can share what they have with others. So I, I do hope that that is a very big conversation that families will have. Yeah. You know, I, and I know every time I, I, I mention this, I, I sound like a guy who's almost a hundred years old, but you know, I see the fashion these days where, where a guy's in and, and gals will go out and they'll pay extra money for jeans that are torn and right. ripped. And I always say, I goes, man, I was, I had to wear those jeans when I was a kid and I was embarrassed that I had to wear them, but I didn't have any choice. Because it's right. all that we had. Yes. You know, or one or two pairs of shoes instead of 15 mm-hmm. or a different pair of tennis shoes for every sport. Yeah. You know, so it's, it is, it's, it's good. So I'm very excited about this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what was the inspiration uh, for Nancy Bess? Who, was there somebody that, that you had in mind? Well, I named her after my grandmother, who was from Arkansas and had come out to California. And she was the ultimate person in making anything out of anything. She just, and I, I got into, she loved to sew and do crafts and she I still have a lot of her things. She was, she lived until nine to be 99 years old. And so um, it was from her. And then another thing, I really love quilts and I got very interested in um, like quilt museums and the history of the fabrics. And a friend gave me these quilt pieces that she had gotten at a yard sale and said, I know you're going to do something with these someday. So I have a stack. Maybe I'll sew them together. I don't know. But I started researching the fabrics and started learning about the feed sacks and how they were reused. And I have talked to a lot of people who whose grandmothers wore the dresses. And I've, I've walked to, talked to older people. I mean, they feed sacks were... Um, printed and being used into the 50s and 60s -hmm. but of course the ones that i'm using were when they first started putting um prints on the fabrics because the flower manufacturers realized that people were reusing the sacks Mm -hmm. and so they decided that they wanted their their flower to be sold so they started to put these amazing prints on on the fabrics uh, you know for their for their flower sacks yeah what a brilliant way to market up a, a product. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to talk to you. You were sharing with me um, uh, a, a little bit about the marketing plan for Nancy Best Had a Dress. And we have lots of authors and aspiring authors who listen to the show, a lot of, of self-published and independent authors. And you were mentioning to me that one of the places that you're hoping to sell Nancy Best Had a Dress is quilt museums. Yes. And that is a very clever and genius idea. Um, And and I think, you know, most, I I think a lot of authors are out there going, wow, I got to get my book on Amazon. I got to get it in the Barnes and Nobles and maybe books a million and maybe my neighborhood bookstore will take four or five on consignment. But there are a lot of places that kids' books are being sold that we don't often think of. 
Yes, I went into a store called The Mercantile and said, I have this book coming out, and it's a gift shop, but it used to be The Mercantile. We would love copies. So I've been stopping at stores. Now I'm also looking, if any of your listeners have suggestions, please send them along. I'm looking for like pioneer museums, Western museums. There's a very nice museum in Los Angeles called the Jean Autry Museum of Western Art. They have a great children's collection there. There's the quilt museum that is in Kansas. So just folk museums and textile museums. I'm reaching out to all sorts of people. And, you know, maybe they'll buy one or two books. But what it, it, anyway, so we're trying to cover the country this way. Yeah, well, that's the reason I pointed it out is that I want um, most authors don't realize when they write the book, they're becoming the CEO of a small business. Yes. And they have no idea that, you know, they're pursuing this artistic endeavor and they think of themselves as artistes. But once that book is published and even before it's published, they have to start thinking of themselves as marketing directors and the CEO of the sales force, and they have to start thinking about clever ways to get their books out in front of people. Um, and, you know, getting into Barnes & Noble is fantastic, but then it's one book alongside a couple gazillion books. And right. uh, your book has a better chance of standing out in that quilt museum where people are, are interested in quilts. And, wow, this is a story that talks about a quilt. And this this would be wonderful to add to our family library. Yes, so yeah. I'm I'm excited to see how that happens, and I'm hoping that I'll get some speaking opportunities at some of these places also. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You were also telling me I think when we first because it takes a long time to to get on the Reading with Your Kids podcast, um, you had a recent Christmas book. Yes. Tell us about the ra- is it the Raven right? Yes, Raven's Gift, and I found an old legend, and um, I changed it and made it more of a Christmas story about a bored young raven who hears the message, the Christmas message from the angels and decides to tell the other birds. So he flies through the night, and all the other birds, like the quail and the dove and the rooster, have gifts to take to the baby Jesus, but he doesn't. And so he's sad when he finally gets there, but they assure him, yes, he has a gift that he shared because he's brought the news and that was a wonderful gift. So you talk about, you know, marketing and this is, um, it's from a publisher called The Little Press. They're based in New Jersey. Wonderful, wonderful people with, she's got a lot of great books coming out. They um, And this is an imprint called Blesses Press. So this was the first book in that imprint. The illustrator is actually from Guatemala. So I have never met her, but we've communicated. And her her art was very quirky and fun. Not exact, not at all what I would have expected, but just fabulous art with a really great color palette. But a Christmas book has a very short marketing um period so you know we really went so that i tried to get into some schools and bookstores and into actually churches there was a church that has a really great community um presence and they took my book and turned it into a play and it was an extravaganza with fabulous costumes and the kids were all dressed as birds and they had farm animals. It was so wonderful. And they did a number of um, presentations of it and sold out. It was great. But not only that, the town I live in has a parade for the Santa Lucia day and it's an evening parade. So they turned it into a float. So this fabulous float went down the street with all these kids you know, dressed as birds singing with my, you know, featuring my book. And as an author, I mean, you can imagine, I was absolutely in tears when that float went by. Yeah. I'm tear up right now talking to you about it. That's amazing. Wow. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. And you mentioned that your illustrator is from Guatemala and uh, the illustrations are very unique. And I just returned from a trip to El Salvador in Guatemala and uh, I, that was one of the things that I took away is Guatemala is a beautiful, beautiful oh. country. Uh, and there's lots of, in Guatemala City, every 
intersection, it seemed, was a, there was a big rotary with some sort of art in the middle of it. And just a beautiful city. Yes, it, it is beautiful. I've been to Antigua. My daughter lived there for a while, so I went and stayed with her for about a month. We went to language school and mm -hmm. um, enjoyed enjoyed that. Yeah. You were sharing with me that you're involved, um, you volunteer for a literacy program, and am I right in thinking that that's serving kids in Nicaragua? It is. Um, I was invited to go with a group called Students International, and they have um, – programs in Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua. And I went down and worked in the education site as I have been a librarian and reading specialist and teacher. It's my, my whole career is about kids and books. Mm -hmm. So I went and got very close with the um, head of the education department. And this is an area about an hour south of Managua. The people that they serve there live around the town dump. The floors are dirt. They have no running water. Um, and the kids, the children go to the public schools, which are just packed. So the younger ones go from about 7 to noon. The older kids go from like 1 to 5 because they just don't have it. And the they just have no resources. So this organization, they do they do medical, agriculture, educational, all sorts of social work, microfinancing. They do a number of different things, but I've been working with the education. So I said, what do you need? And she said, I would like a library. These kids have zero access to books. And so a number of organizations and churches um, had raised money and built this beautiful center called El Faro, which means the lighthouse. And part of that was an education center. So I started a library. All the books are in Spanish. I have a local bookstore that gives me a good discount. And a lot of people help me out with different books, but the children do need to learn to read in Spanish. And at first they didn't let them take them home, but now they do. So the children are helping and reading with their parents and their younger siblings. So we are starting basically to get literacy into this small community, and it is very fulfilling. But as life happens, my daughter and her son-in-law decided to work for this organization. So he's a physical therapist. She does orthotics and prosthetics, and they have their two children, my grandchildren, and they've moved to Nicaragua. They've been there for six years now. Wow. So that's part of it, too. So I go down probably maybe three three times a year now. Mm -hmm. um, and she's actually working in the education site with the teacher. But And then we go to the public schools and help out in the public schools. And uh, it's it's been just an incredible experience, sort of changed my life and focus of my life, actually. Yeah, I've I've had the the opportunity to travel through four countries in Central America, and I love it. I love the people. The it is one of the most beautiful places, natural yeah. beauty on earth. Uh, you know, if, in El Salvador, it, everywhere you turn, there's a volcano, right. and it's just spectacular. And the beaches and the coast, and 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 again, the people that we encountered, whether it's Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, the people are beautiful. There's a lot yes. of problems, but um, I'm, I'm really happy that you're involved in, in helping to bring literacy to um, the, the, the kids in Nicaragua because that, is, I think, is the thing that is going to lift people up out of poverty is, is literacy. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you cannot read, what are you going to do? I mean, they're they're really your options are very, very limited if you can't read just starting right there. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit, please, because I think I think in, in this day and age of the Internet and everything at our fingers immediately, there's no need to go to the library to research things when you can just type it into your phone and get an answer back in in seconds. Um I believe that libraries are still very vital, not only to poor communities, but to every community. Can you just talk a little bit about how important you think libraries are and the best way we can help support libraries? Well, I'm one of those kids who went to the library every Saturday as a child and started. I mean, I still remember the children's librarian reading to me. 
and um you know to the groups of kids and the reading her reading ferdinand i will never forget you know being introduced to that book and you know we it was very i loved being a librarian because i felt like i had a brain workout every day so even though you can find so much on the information you know information on the web for resources librarians are the keys to what you really need you know they can get through all filter through all the chaos or not not chaos there's just too much information is mm-hmm. what there is and help you get to what you need but i'm i look at libraries as a community resource i'm involved here in central california with a group called reformative ia central which reaches out to the spanish speaking population to help with their information needs and they get books into the halls but they do uh visits with the schools they reach out it's so so it's just created this wonderful community and and if you haven't been to a library you need to go and become friends of the library help the librarians especially in the summer with all the wonderful programming that's going on for children you know you can save a lot of money and find a lot of great things to do at the library our library they've brought in like people to talk about dinosaurs or reptiles or you know all you know there's just movies and all sorts of things we have a one town one book where every year they pick a book like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and everybody in town reads it and it's just been really great i think it's just one of the best community resources that exist but people don't realize it and if we don't start supporting the libraries we're going to lose them yeah. because a lot of people don't value them yeah it's it's very very important i know i've had the honor of performing um at thousands of libraries over the years and it it it's wonderful to to go and see the library filled with these smiling faces and then after the they experience the magic. They then jump into the magic of books, and um, that is wonderful. We still have one book of yours to talk about, and I understand that it is now available both in English and Spanish, which must must be yes. bring a lot of joy to you. It. I was. I was so happy. It came out in English, and I, it's through Cardinal Rule Press called Evie's Field Day: More Than One Way to Win. And at the very beginning, I said, hey, would it be possible if it, you could do a Spanish edition? And she goes, I don't know. But now Cardinal Rule Press, which is also another phenomenal publisher, um, is is bringing a lot of their books out in, in Spanish. And um, so it was very fun to get to go down and read my book with the kids in Nicaragua. Yeah. So tell us just a little bit about Evie, please. Evie is a girl who loves to win. And she has trophies on her uh, in her room and ribbons. So when the school field day comes along, she's thrilled because she knows she's going to get a lot more prizes. But unfortunately, she doesn't. And the book features a lot of very old-fashioned games like um, musical hoops and beanbag toss, the kind of things that they do, you know, during schools um, on their field days. Mm-hmm. So she keeps losing. She's very discouraged, and she's not a very good sport when her friends win the other things. But finally, at the end, she's winning the sack race, and a little bird, she sees a little bird that had fluttered out of the tree, and she knows she can jump over the bird, but what if the other children can't see it? So she has to make a decision whether to win the race or save the bird. And so it it just, it's a very fun book on sportsmanship, and um, I think, Kids seem to really, really like that book. That's wonderful. Hey, there's so much going on in your life. Um, Where can people go to find out more about Nancy Best, How to Dress, and also find out more about all the wonderful things that are coming from your imagination? Probably the one place is my uh, website, which is clarinetnolan.com. I'm very active on Instagram. I found that that is a place where a lot of authors, illustrators, parents, librarians, and teachers hang out. So there's a lot of community there, and it's very visual. So that that is Clarinet Nolan Books. And um, those are probably the best places to find. And I did want to just mention one thing. I am published with three publishers that are run by very dynamic women. And for your um, listeners who are looking at books to get published, 
you know, don't always look at Scholastic. Those, you know, those ones, they're wonderful, but there are some great things going on with the smaller presses. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we had the uh, founder and CEO of Cardinal Rue Press um, on our podcast not too long ago. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a wonderful time speaking to the author of Nancy Best Had a Dress. Our guest has been Claire Nolan. Claire, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And if anybody has any questions, I'd love to hear from you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. And we'll join us for the next exciting episode of the show. To make sure you don't miss a moment of the show, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, Boom Play, Player FM, wherever you find your podcasts. And please be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can uh, click on the Parents Click Here button at the top of the page, check out our blog, our certified great reads, and download our free online magazine. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our amazing guests. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Kyoko Ito, Nick Warner, Sydney Swan, Kayla Newland, Kristen Barrett, Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. You are amazing. You are the most important person in your kid's life, and you make the world a better place every time you choose to read with your kid. I'll be looking to you in the next exciting episode of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.